government restricted in power. It's powerful enough to protect people's God-given liberty and other inalienable rights. It's energetic enough to help make the country a better place and ensure that we all have opportunities to thrive. But it's not so powerful that it threatens our rights and squelches opportunity. The country's founders tried hard to restrict the government's power with the checks and balances they built into the system, like giving the president power to veto bills passed by Congress. They also tried to make sure that power would be divided between the federal and state governments. Why did the founders want to limit government? They were students of human nature and history. They knew that there are people who love to wield power over others. As Samuel Adams put it, ambition and lust of power above the law are predominant passions in the breasts of most men. The founders also knew that over time, governments have a tendency to amass power. For most of the world's history, after all, people had lived under rulers who grabbed all the power they could get. If government's power is unrestricted, it will naturally grow and control more of people's lives. According to Thomas Jefferson, the natural progress of things is for liberty to yield and government to gain ground. Abraham Lincoln left us with a good description of limited government. He wrote, The legitimate object of government is to do for a community of people whatever they need to have done but cannot do at all, or cannot so well do for themselves in their separate and individual capacities. In all that the people can individually do as well for themselves, government ought not to interfere. Do we have limited government in the United States today? No, it keeps growing like a snowball rolling down a hill toward Hades, to paraphrase a country song. It started out small. When Thomas Jefferson was the Secretary of State, for example, he had seven employees working at the State Department. Today, the federal government employs around 2.7 million civil servants. That number doesn't count uniformed members of the armed forces or legions of private contract workers the government hires. Altogether, federal, state, and local governments in the United States employ about 22 million people. Federal bureaucracies issue more than 3,500 new regulations every year, affecting everything from the clothes we wear to the schools we attend to the television shows we watch. The Federal Register, the official journal containing U.S. government rules, is about 80,000 pages long. As the chart below shows, the government keeps piling regulations onto the American people. To be fair, much of government's expansion is due to the growth of the country's population and changes in the world. In George Washington's day, we didn't face issues like dealing with Islamic terrorism or the disposal of nuclear waste materials. But much growth has come from the government taking more and more power for itself, just as the founders feared. Many officials in Washington, D.C. think they know better than people living in places like Iowa and Alabama. They believe they should wield power because they have superior wisdom and expertise. In truth, there is no special wisdom that comes from being in Washington, D.C. Working in the nation's capital doesn't make you smarter or more knowledgeable than Americans elsewhere. Yet, a we-know-what's-best-for-you mindset is often the way the federal government acts. Many politicians go to Washington pledging to cut the size of government programs, but that almost never happens. Washington is full of lobbyists representing groups that want money, services, or regulations from the government, and they often get what they want. Laws get stuffed with so many goodies for different groups that lawmakers often aren't sure what's in the legislation they pass. Once a government program is born, it's almost impossible to get rid of. It just keeps growing and growing. Who made government so big and powerful? Ultimately, the American people themselves are responsible for government growing so much. In election after election, they have voted for politicians who supported expanding government. 
Many people, it seems, are for smaller government in theory, but accept larger government in reality. They're in favor of cutting government programs, but not if it means cutting any programs that benefit them personally. Both political parties, Democrat and Republican, have had a hand in growing government. Liberals, whether Democrats or Republicans, are the main supporters of big government. Liberal solutions to problems almost always mean more government programs and more government spending. To understand how government got so big, it helps to know a little history. Government expansion began in earnest with the progressive movement in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Progressive reformers like Theodore Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson believed that the founders' vision of limited government was outdated. They argued that in an age of industrialization and giant corporations that could take advantage of people, government needed to fashion a more just society. As Woodrow Wilson wrote, Government does now whatever experience permits or the times demand. Government grew even larger in the 1930s under President Franklin D. Roosevelt's New Deal. Roosevelt believed that because of the Great Depression, the federal government needed to do much more to regulate the economy and improve people's living conditions. He set up a raft of agencies like the Securities and Exchange Commission and the Works Progress Administration. Under the New Deal, power shifted from state and local governments to Washington, D.C. In the 1960s, President Lyndon B. Johnson's Great Society agenda expanded government even more. The Great Society's aim was to bring an end to poverty and racial injustice, as well as enrich and elevate our national life. Johnson launched programs that included funding for schools, job training for the unemployed, housing projects to replace slums, food stamps for the needy, money to encourage the arts, and Medicare and Medicaid, which provide health care for the elderly and the poor. More recently, President Barack Obama's Affordable Care Act, often called Obamacare, pushed government even deeper into daily life. It gives government much more control over America's health care system. Today, the federal government runs more programs, spends more money, and wields more power than ever. Its influence over Americans' lives would stun men like James Madison and Thomas Jefferson. What's so bad about big government? The federal government is so huge and bloated, it creates all sorts of problems. Big government is wildly expensive. Washington spends a massive amount of money. In 2014, it spent about $3.5 trillion. It borrowed about 14 cents out of every dollar spent. It has racked up $18 trillion in debt, a number that keeps rising. That comes to nearly $60,000 of debt for every American. No one knows how that money will be repaid. Federal regulations are also extremely expensive. Businesses must build the cost of complying with regulations into the price of goods and services they sell. When you buy something, whether it be a loaf of bread or a cell phone, you help pay for those regulations. According to one estimate, regulations cost each American household, on average, about $15,000 per year. Some people believe we are getting to the point where we will not be able to curb big government spending habits. If that happens the country may well go broke. Bureaucracy is inefficient and wasteful. Stories of government waste are so common, people barely notice them anymore. In 2014, for example, the Social Security Administration revealed that it had spent six years and nearly $300 million on a computer system that didn't work. In 2013, the Interior Department spent nearly $100,000 to install an outhouse with one toilet and no plumbing on an Alaskan trail. The National Institutes of Health spent over $335,000 on a study to find out if married couples are happier if wives calm down quickly after an argument. They are. Fraud and abuse can be a big problem. For example, Medicare and Medicaid, 
huge programs that pay for health care for the elderly and poor, have rampant problems with health care providers overbilling the government. No one even knows how much abuse is involved. It may be as high as $100 billion a year or more. With so many programs paying out so much money, people are bound to take advantage. The government reports billions of dollars in improper unemployment payments every year. Investigations by the Social Security Administration have turned up massive fraud by people faking or exaggerating disabilities to get money. Many programs don't work well or at all. They keep going anyway and even get bigger. Head Start is a good example. Launched in 1965, Head Start is a preschool program for children from low-income families. Its goal is to help those children get ready for elementary school. About one million children are enrolled in the program each year. Despite its intentions, Head Start does little, if any, good when it comes to education. According to a study released by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, the program has no lasting effects on children's achievement in school. Yet Head Start costs around $8 billion per year. Ironically, it is a very popular program. Big Government Can Stifle the Economy Dealing with excessive regulation costs time and money. It slows businesses and chokes opportunities. The late George McGovern, a well-known liberal senator from South Dakota, learned that lesson the hard way. After retiring from the U.S. Senate, he followed a dream of operating a hotel. McGovern quickly learned how much time and money it takes to deal with government regulations. It is a simple concern that is nonetheless often ignored by legislators, he wrote. He realized that if he had known what it was like to be a businessman before he was a senator, he would not have supported so many regulations. Big government poses risks to freedom. This may be the most damaging effect of all. More than half of Americans surveyed say that the federal government threatens their personal rights and freedoms. That view would surely discourage the founders who set out to design a government to protect people's rights. Government is so big that it has something to say about virtually every aspect of our lives. Federal rules determine how much water our toilets use and what kind of light bulbs we screw into our lamps. They dictate what kind of ingredients go into our food and what kind of mileage our cars get. Laws are necessary, of course. They help make sure the meat we buy is safe and our rivers are clean. But the larger and more powerful government becomes the more control it has over our lives. The question is, where do we cross the line from being the land of the free to becoming a land of government decree? Is it possible to check government's growth? Yes, if enough people understand and respect the principle of limited government. Here are a few questions to ask when someone starts talking about government doing more. Is a proposed law or program truly needed? Many laws get passed not because of real need, but because of something someone wants, like money for a pet project. If a bill or expenditure is not related to a basic function of government, it deserves extra scrutiny. How much is a proposed law or regulation going to cost? How is it going to be paid for? Government officials are notorious for underestimating how much programs will cost. If you hear them throw out a number, you can often double or even triple it to get an idea of the true cost. Could a proposed law be handled better at the local or state level than at the federal level? As a general rule, the closer a government is to the people, the better it knows what kind of laws people want and what sort of laws will work in that place. Can the private sector handle this better than the public sector? Businesses are usually more efficient quicker, and more innovative at solving problems than government is. Likewise, nonprofit organizations and volunteer agencies are often better at helping people than government. Is a proposed law too vague? The U.S. Congress has gotten into the habit of passing vague laws that leave the details up to government agencies to decide. 
This opens the door for unelected officials in the bureaucracy to issue more and more regulations. Vague laws also lead to lawsuits and judges having to decide what the laws really mean. Does a proposed law respect the idea of personal responsibility? Is it setting government up to take over an obligation that people really should be taking care of themselves? If so, then red flags should be flying. At the end of the day, the American people have to avoid the mistake of thinking that government has a solution for every problem. Yes, government has important jobs to do. But a free republic needs citizens who take responsibility for themselves and their families and who help their neighbors and communities instead of always looking to big government for answers. What's the alternative to big government? The alternative is smarter, better government. Yes, conservatives want to limit government's growth and cut it back where possible. They want to stop out-of-control spending and borrowing in Washington, D.C. They're in favor of taking a close look at government operations and asking questions like, is this program really working and do we really need it? But conservatives also recognize that modern government has much important work to do, from providing a safety net for the poor to keeping air travel safe. Conservatives want to improve government while limiting it. They want to streamline it and make it more responsive to people's needs. Conservatives don't want to eliminate government. They want to reform it. Instead of government that says, here is a pile of regulations to tell you how you have to do things, they want government that asks, what can we do to help people and businesses thrive? For example, over the last several decades, the federal government has taken more and more control of America's health care system. The more control it has taken, the higher health care costs have shot. Conservatives want government to protect Americans with laws that ensure they have access to good health care, but they also want less government control of health care markets. They want to use the power of free markets to make health care more affordable. Tax reform is another example. The U.S. tax code contains nearly 4 million words. It's a tangled net of rules, rates, deductions, and exemptions. Altogether, Americans spend billions of hours and dollars every year to prepare their returns. Conservatives want a simplified, straightforward tax system that people can actually understand, one that adequately funds the government, aids the poor, and helps the middle class thrive. The federal government is like a big clunky machine with thousands of parts. Some of the parts don't work very well, but we keep adding more pieces to keep the machine rumbling along. We add more and more government, thinking that will make things better. There's a smarter way. Think of a cell phone or tablet. Over the years, those devices haven't grown bigger and more clunky. They've gotten sleeker nimbler and more user-friendly. They put users in control with different apps and options to choose from. They're designed to help people create things, meet challenges, and solve problems. Each new version gives more bang for the buck. That's the direction the world of technology keeps moving. Government should do the same. Where should we look for solutions if not to big government? Government can and should help solve problems, but Washington, D.C. or the state capital shouldn't be the first place we automatically turn. If we do, we're likely to be disappointed. The conservative vision is one of Americans helping each other. It's a vision of energetic communities of people working together to solve problems and build better lives, not waiting a long time, often in vain, for big government to fix things. Imagine for a minute that you're in trouble or have a problem you need help solving. Are you going to pull out your phone and call an agency in Washington, D.C. to come solve it for you? No. You're probably going to turn to people close to you, perhaps family or members of your church or neighbors or maybe local government, people in your community. That's how we live, grow, and thrive best, not as isolated individuals, but as members of a community of some kind. 
That's how America has prospered over the years. People using their freedom to band together, get things done, and help others. Alexis de Tocqueville, a French political philosopher who visited the young United States in 1831 and published his impressions in the classic Democracy in America, wrote that Americans were forever forming associations to get things done. Americans combine to give feats, found seminaries, build churches, distribute books, and send missionaries to the Antipodes, he wrote. Hospitals, prisons, and schools take shape in that way. That spirit of pitching in, cooperating, and helping each other has always been a great strength of our country. Go to any thriving community in the United States and you'll find groups of people working together to improve society. Families, churches, synagogues, charities, neighborhood associations, businesses, chambers of commerce, civic clubs, and so on. The 18th century British statesman Edmund Burke called such groups little platoons. Modern academics call them mediating institutions. They mean the same thing, groups of people working together of their own free will to help each other and strengthen community. Conservatives believe in a strong role for the little platoons of society. They exist in the space between the individual and the government where we live our lives. They are the groups on whose back society moves. In the last few decades, big government has tried to take over and crowd out some of the work of the little platoons. It hasn't worked well. Big government agencies don't do a good job of filling in for families and communities. The conservative vision is one of people coming together to help each other without government running the show. The more that happens, the stronger and more vibrant our democracy becomes. That's not an unrealistic vision. It's something Americans know how to do well. What's unrealistic is a mindset that assumes the federal government can take the lead in making our lives better for us. Where does government come in? Government plays an important role in this mix. It does necessary things, like providing defense at the national level and maintaining roads at the state and local levels. It also helps people, but not by producing mounds of regulations and trying to manage people's lives. Government can help make sure everyone gets a fair chance and plays by the same rules. It can help communities work on projects and ideas that improve lives. It can lend a hand to help people up and provide aid to those who need it most. Government should do all these things in a supporting role, not a controlling one. Conservatives believe in what's called the principle of subsidiarity. It holds that a problem is usually best solved by local institutions closest to the problem. They know the conditions best and have the most interest in fixing things. The principle of subsidiarity recognizes that the knowledge and skill to address problems is spread out all over the country, not held by just a few all-knowing experts in Washington, D.C., Solving a problem is usually a face-to-face -face effort. It takes people working directly with each other. Distant, faceless bureaucracies in Washington usually aren't the best solution. Their intentions may be good, but to big government agencies, problems in far-off parts of the country are about as personal as numbers on a page. It's almost impossible for the federal government to come up with policies that fit the lives of more than 300 million people. The bottoms-up process of solving problems and improving lives works best. Responsibility for action should lie with the group closest to the problem – families, community groups, local governments, and state governments. If the closest group can't get it done, then help can come from the next level up. Federal government should be the last resort, not the first. In fact, when big government tries to do too much, it makes people less energetic about improving their communities. It leads them into a habit of thinking that somebody else will eventually come along to fix things. As de Tocqueville wrote, The more government takes the place of associations, 
the more will individuals lose the idea of forming associations and need the government to come to their help. The bottoms-up approach requires a lot of responsibility, individuals taking responsibility for their own actions and families taking responsibility for raising their children. It requires people fulfilling their duties to neighbors, community, and country. The performance of those duties makes society work and ultimately makes the United States a great nation. The Welfare State Welcome to the life of Julia. At age three, Julia enters the federal Head Start preschool program to get ready for school. By age 17, she's the product of a high school that's in a federal education improvement program. At age 18, she qualifies for federal student aid so her family can afford college. At age 22, while in college, Julia undergoes surgery covered by her parents' insurance thanks to federal health care reform. At 25, after college, she makes monthly payments on her federal student loans. At 27, she can focus on her work as a web designer rather than worry about her health because the federal government requires her insurance to cover birth control and preventative care. At age 31, Julia decides to have a child. We don't know who the father is because no men appear in the life of Julia. While pregnant, she gets checkups and free screenings under federal health care laws. At 37, she sends her son to a kindergarten that has better facilities and great teachers because of federal programs. At 42, Julia starts her own web business thanks to a federal loan program. At 65, she enrolls in Medicare, the federal health insurance program for older Americans. At 67, she retires, and the federal government begins sending Social Security checks, which allow her to volunteer in a community garden. The Life of Julia was a fictional cartoon slideshow commercial shown on the Internet by President Barack Obama's campaign when he ran for re-election in 2012. The aim was to illustrate how the modern welfare state, as envisioned by liberals such as President Obama, can provide a secure, comfortable life. The commercial backfired with many Americans who saw it, especially conservatives. It left them asking, do we want government that is everywhere? Do we really want each stage of our lives tied to a big government program? Yet many others seem to accept this liberal vision of a welfare state that takes care of people from cradle to grave. They helped re-elect President Obama to a second term. Are Americans now comfortable living in a modern welfare state that supplies so many government benefits? Or have government programs become so bloated, expensive, and intrusive that it's time to say, enough? What is the welfare state? In a welfare state, government assumes large responsibility for people's well-being, including their financial needs. Germany and the United Kingdom, for example, are welfare states. The United States, in many ways, has become one. The modern welfare state emerged in Germany in the 1880s under Chancellor Otto von Bismarck when German industrial workers protested poor working and living conditions. Bismarck introduced government programs for sickness insurance, accident insurance, and old-age pensions. Over the next several decades, the welfare state spread to other European nations. Programs expanded to include everything from government-run child care and education to health care and housing assistance. The idea of the welfare state did not take hold in the United States as soon as it did in Europe. That's because for centuries, Europeans had looked to kings and nobility to protect them in times of danger. For many people there, it made sense that modern government should help protect them from problems like unemployment or even sickness. The United States, on the other hand, was founded on the belief that power concentrated in the hands of government was a threat to liberty. Americans tended to believe that people should take care of themselves, their families, and their neighbors instead of depending on government for basic needs. That thinking changed during the Great Depression of the 1930s, when millions were thrown out of work. People looked to the government for help 
and President Franklin D. Roosevelt introduced programs he called the New Deal to put people back to work and guarantee everyone a standard of living. The U.S. welfare state grew more in the 1960s with President Lyndon B. Johnson's Great Society programs, which were meant to bring an end to poverty and racial injustice and advance the quality of our American civilization. Liberals wanted to use government to engineer a society that serves not only the needs of the body and the demands of commerce, but the desire for beauty and the hunger for community. The American welfare state has continued to grow into a vast network of agencies that administer hundreds of programs delivering money, goods, and services to millions of people. Some of the largest and most well-known federal programs are Social Security, which provides monthly checks to the elderly to help with living expenses, Medicare, which covers health care for the elderly, and Medicaid, which provides health care for the poor. In 2010, with the passage of the Affordable Care Act, also known as Obamacare, the federal government took control of much of the country's health care system. Other federal programs include food stamps to help the needy pay for groceries, low-income housing assistance, aid to low-income women and children, unemployment benefits, employment training, free or low-cost school lunches, funding for public education, child care and preschool for poor children, college loans and grants, and payments to low-income people who have jobs. Those are just a few of the many federal programs. There are also hundreds of agencies and programs run by the states. In the 1980s, about a third of Americans lived in a household receiving benefits of some kind from the government. Today, about one-half of all Americans do. That is stunning growth. But is it good? How much does the American welfare state cost? The modern American welfare state is so massive and contains so many programs at the federal and state levels that it's hard for anyone to calculate exactly how much it costs. The bottom line is that it is enormously expensive. Its cost dwarfs many countries' entire budgets. Much of this spending goes to entitlement programs. They're called entitlements because people who fall into certain groups are entitled by law to receive benefits. For example, all Americans over the age of 65 who have worked and paid taxes into the system are entitled to Medicare insurance, which pays for health care. Medicare is one of the three most expensive federal entitlement programs. The other two are Medicaid, health care insurance for the poor, and Social Security, retirement income for the elderly. Over the last half century, entitlement spending has soared. In 1960, it made up well under one-third of federal spending. By 2010, it had grown to about two-thirds. In that year alone, federal, state, and local governments oversaw more than $2.2 trillion of spending on entitlement programs. In order to pay for that amount, government would have to tax every man, woman, and child in the country more than $7,200. And that's for just one year of entitlement spending. Within living memory, the federal government has become an entitlements machine, observes Nicholas Eberstadt of the American Enterprise Institute. As a day-to-day operation, it devotes more attention and resources to the public transfer of money, goods, and services to individual citizens than to any other objective, spending more than for all other ends combined. As the American welfare state has grown, government has raised taxes and borrowed more and more money to cover its cost. This spending, particularly on Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, is the main reason Americans now face a crushing public debt. Entitlement spending, along with the cost of paying for our national debt, is on course to swallow every dollar of tax money the federal government collects by 2030. The United States isn't the only country with this problem. Europe's welfare states have also accumulated massive debts because of unsustainable spending. Their governments, too, will run out of money before long if something does not change. Has all this spending worked? 
Some of it has. Many government efforts, from the interstate highway system to programs that help veterans to medical research that fights disease, have made a positive difference in people's lives. There is no question that in many ways, Americans' tax dollars have done much good. At the same time, many government programs have not achieved their aims. Take, for example, the multitude of government programs aimed at fighting poverty. The federal government launched its War on Poverty in the 1960s during President Lyndon Johnson's administration. Our aim is not only to relieve the symptom of poverty, but to cure it, and above all, to prevent it, Johnson declared. In other words, Johnson's goal was to help low-income Americans climb out of poverty and become self-sufficient so they wouldn't need government aid in the future. Since that time, government has spent more than $20 trillion on programs that provide cash, food, housing, medical care, and other services for the poor. Yet for all that spending, the U.S. Census Bureau reports that the poverty rate has not changed much in the last 50 years. It's stuck at around 15% of the population. Today, millions of people are receiving thousands of dollars a year in government benefits, but they still earn very little money on their own. Aiding the poor is a noble endeavor that we should all want to take part in. But if the aim is to help people climb out of poverty, rather than have them depend on government assistance year after year, then the government's massive spending programs are a terrible failure. Even programs that have improved people's lives are often poorly designed and run. Social Security and Medicare, for example, have helped millions of Americans, but are driving the country further and further into debt. Within two decades, unless something is done, those programs won't have enough money to cover expenses. It will take tens of trillions of dollars to pay out all the Social Security and Medicare benefits the government has promised. No one knows where all that money will come from. This is a fundamental problem of the modern welfare state. It grows in size and power by promising citizens more and more benefits. But it is often over-promised. It simply does not have the money to pay for it all. How is an ever-expanding welfare state at odds with conservative principles? An ever-growing, overreaching welfare state is at odds with conservative principles and common sense in several ways. First, it is not financially sustainable. Government can't go on borrowing money year after year for entitlement programs it can't afford. At some point, one way or another, someone will have to pay for all the spending. The debt will fall on young people and on future generations. It is morally wrong to cripple them with that burden. Furthermore, the ever-growing welfare state reduces liberty. The more regulations big government issues, the fewer individual freedoms we have. Big government is sometimes called the nanny state because it tries to micromanage people's lives. For example, in the name of looking after citizens' well-being, the federal government has even issued rules saying what sort of food and drinks students can sell at school bake sales. An overreaching welfare state weakens the American character. That a free people should take responsibility for their own lives is a very American ideal. As the government takes more and more charge of people's well-being, people expect the government to take care of problems for them. That undermines personal responsibility. It can also undermine the spirit of work. If people don't have to work, many will choose not to. This is human nature. When big government sends the message, you will be taken care of, and then follows that message with years of entitlement benefits, it can erode people's desire to earn their own living. It's no coincidence that as the welfare state has expanded, many people have stopped working. The more the government does for us, the more we come to rely on it. It creates a sense of dependency on the government while destroying self-reliance. It can even create a sense among people that they are entitled to government payouts and services. President Franklin Roosevelt, who in many ways launched the American welfare state, recognized the dangers of dependency on government 
He said that, Continued dependence upon relief induces a spiritual and moral disintegration fundamentally destructive to the national fiber. To dole out relief in this way is to administer a narcotic, a subtle destroyer of the human spirit. Those are good words to ponder, as three quarters of a century later, the welfare state continues to grow. Do conservatives want to get rid of all government benefit programs? No. Most conservatives want to change the modern welfare state as we know it, one that is continually growing and taking more power for itself. But they certainly understand that there are people who need help from government programs. They also understand that those people are not just takers. Congressman Paul Ryan of Wisconsin tells how he and other policymakers had fallen into the habit of using the phrase makers and takers to describe two broad categories of Americans. Makers refer to those who pay more taxes than they get back in benefits from the government. Takers meant those people who receive more government benefits than they pay in taxes. One day, when Ryan was at the Wisconsin State Fair, a man challenged him with the question, who exactly are the takers? Excuse me, Ryan asked. The makers and the takers, the man said. I know who the makers are, but who are the takers? Is it the person who lost their job and is on unemployment benefits? Is it the veteran who served in Iraq and gets their medical care through the VA, Veterans Administration? When you talk about the takers, who exactly do you mean? As Ryan listened, he thought, holy cow, he's right. Lumping people into broad categories like makers and takers overlooks the real hardships people sometimes face in life. It makes it sound as if people who are struggling are deadbeats. But there are many people who have worked hard, paid their dues, and then, for one reason or another, fallen on hard times. Of course, there are real takers, people on government assistance who don't really need it, who are abusing the system. There is no doubt about that, and that abuse needs to stop. But as Congressman Ryan points out, there are also millions of Americans who at some point in their lives are in a position of true need, and government can make a difference for them. Conservatives don't want government to stop helping those people, but they do expect government to operate programs in smart, effective ways that don't waste taxpayer dollars and aren't rife with abuse. They expect government to make a distinction between people who truly need and deserve help and people who are simply looking for a handout. Conservatives are also realists. They know there are limits to what government can and should do. Government programs that don't get results should be reformed or done away with so resources can be put to work in ways that do get results. How do conservatives want to help those in need? Conservatives are against the idea of a welfare state that shepherds people through life with government programs. But they also believe that America should use its vast resources to help those in real need. Here are a few principles that conservatives hold to when it comes to government helping others. Aid should be focused on those who truly need it. Government can and should provide a safety net to help catch those who have fallen on hard times and those who are unable to care for themselves. But a government that keeps promising more and more benefits to more and more people is putting society on a self-destructive course. It will bankrupt the country and end up doing far more harm than good. Instead, we should focus resources on those who need help the most. Government programs must always encourage personal responsibility. They must never send the message that government can take care of all needs or protect from all hardship and misfortune in life. Robert Doerr, former commissioner of New York City's Principal Social Services Agency, put it this way, The minute a welfare applicant believes that government will solve all of her problems, she loses. Accepting responsibility for one's own future is the vital first step to moving up. Dorr and his colleagues applied conservative principles to welfare reform in New York City, and the results were impressive. The number of people on welfare dropped by hundreds of thousands, 
former welfare recipients went to work, and child poverty levels shrank. Government benefits should not be designed to last forever. Some programs, such as those that help the elderly or the permanently disabled, must provide long-term help. But generally speaking, programs should be designed to get those in need back on their feet and off government assistance as quickly as possible. When people begin to think of the government as a permanent source of income, it leaves them in a state of dependency. When appropriate, programs should require people to work. This applies in particular to welfare programs for low-income people. One of the best ways to get and keep people off welfare is to require them to work full-time in return for aid. Full-time work is also the best way for people to climb out of poverty. In 1996, Congress passed legislation reforming a welfare program that provides aid to poor single mothers. The legislation required aid recipients to get full-time work. Many experts predicted disaster. They said that welfare mothers could not work and that the change would throw a million more children into poverty. In fact, the opposite happened. More than a million single mothers found jobs and poverty levels dropped. More reform like that needs to happen. We must do everything we can to strengthen families. The decline of the two-parent family is a major cause of poverty in this country. The scholar Lawrence Mead writes, Poor families typically arise when parents have children without marrying and then do not work regularly to support them. Usually, the father disappears without paying child support, often due to failure to work. The widespread birth of children to unwed mothers has become a national tragedy. Strong two-parent families are critical for fighting poverty. Government should not be the first place people look to for help. Conservatives believe it should be a last resort. That belief brings with it a responsibility to step up and help those in need with personal action and giving. In other words, we shouldn't wait for government to help others. We should do it ourselves, through churches, temples, neighborhood associations, charities, civic clubs, or volunteer groups. The best kind of help is given with our own hands. Taxes and Spending On a cold, damp December night in 1773, a few dozen colonists wearing old clothes and black faces tramped through the streets of Boston toward three ships tied up at Griffin's Wharf. The Mohawks, as they called themselves, clambered aboard the Dartmouth, the Eleanor, and the Beaver, and began hoisting chests of tea from the vessel's holds onto the decks. They carried 342 chests to the rails, split them open, and dumped the tea into Boston Harbor. The late-night raid was a protest over a tea tax. The Americans were angry that England was taxing them even though they had no representatives in Parliament. To the protesters, taxes and tea had become symbols of British oppression. No taxation without representation sounded up and down the colonies. In less than three hours, the Boston Tea Party was over. Their work done, the Mohawks swept the ship's decks, bid the crews farewell, and marched into the night whistling Yankee Doodle. King George III was outraged at the act of defiance. We must master them or totally leave them alone, he declared. His colonies were on the road to revolution. To this day, taxes remain a touchy subject in America for all kinds of reasons. They represent one of the major divides between conservatives and liberals. Generally speaking, liberals are apt to favor raising taxes so the government can spend more money. Conservatives, on the other hand, favor lower taxes and less government spending. They believe high taxes and spending can sink the economy and end up hurting everyone. That's the view of the modern-day Tea Party movement. It takes its name from that long-ago night in Boston. The mainstream media like to paint the Tea Party as extremist. But its message is no less extreme than the Patriots in 1773, and in fact, makes much common sense. 
Are taxes good or bad? Most taxpayers would probably call them a necessary evil. We must pay taxes to have a functioning government. Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes put it this way more than a hundred years ago Taxes are what we pay for civilized society. So taxes in general are necessary, but in some cases, they can be harmful. High taxes are bad because they take money out of the hands of people and businesses that would otherwise be using it to buy things, make things, provide services, and hire workers. In other words, all the activities required to make the economy go. High taxes also hurt individual freedom. The more the government takes in taxes, the more control it has, and the less freedom you have to use that money the way you want. The Greek philosopher Aristotle pointed out centuries ago that one way ancient tyrants controlled people was to multiply taxes. Taxes are bad when the government wastes them. Unfortunately, this happens all the time. For example, the government wastes millions of tax dollars sending food stamps to people who are dead or not entitled to receive them. It has wasted billions subsidizing corporations, from big agriculture companies to green energy startups to defense contractors. It has wasted billions more on duplicative government programs and computer systems. Taxes are also harmful when they get so complicated that most people can't understand them. That creates confusion and frustration. U.S. income tax laws have become so complex, it takes 74,000 pages to explain them. Every year, millions of people have to hire accountants just to figure out how much they might owe. Albert Einstein once remarked that the hardest thing in the world to understand is income taxes. When taxes are more complicated than the theory of relativity is to Einstein, something is wrong. Where does all the money go? A billion here, a billion there. Pretty soon you're talking real money. The late Senator Everett Dirksen of Illinois reportedly uttered that line. It pretty much sums up the way spending goes in Washington, D.C. The nearby chart breaks down federal spending in 2014. In that year, Americans paid about $3 trillion in federal taxes. And $1.5 trillion in state taxes. Keep in mind that the federal government actually spends much more than it receives in taxes. In 2014, it borrowed 14 cents out of every dollar it spent. Most of the federal budget goes to programs that provide benefits to people Medicare, health care insurance for the elderly, Medicaid, health care insurance for the poor, and Social Security. Retirement income for the elderly are the three largest government benefit programs. Altogether, these major benefit programs account for about five out of every ten dollars the federal government spends. These programs are growing and taking over more of the federal budget every year. If nothing changes, benefit programs and interest paid on the national debt will take over the entire federal budget within a generation. There will be no money left for vital government functions, such as providing for national defense, running the court system, or keeping ambassadors overseas. There will not even be enough money left over to collect taxes. How do high taxes hurt people? High income taxes can hurt people by hurting the economy. Here's how it works When the government takes more from people in taxes, They have less money in their pockets to buy things. That means less business for the makers and sellers of those products. That slows the economy down, which can throw people out of work and make it harder to find good jobs. The government puts tax money to work in the economy, but government spending is less productive and efficient than private sector spending. High taxes take money out of the hands of entrepreneurs and other business people. That's less money to launch new companies, buy inventory, and hire workers. All of that slows the economy. High income taxes can also discourage work. That's simply human nature. If you know that the government is going to take one quarter of your income, you might be inclined to hustle and make as much as you can. 
But if the government starts taking half of your income or more, you might very well ask yourself, what's the point of working hard if I'm not going to be able to keep much of what I make? Finally, high taxes can keep people from saving. Every dollar that goes into the government is one less dollar someone has to put into a retirement account or invest in the stock market. Lower taxes, on the other hand, can have the opposite effect. Tax cuts can make the economy stronger. The lower the tax rate, the more incentive people have to work, start a business, expand a company, make a new product, or create jobs. And the more freedom they have to use the money they make as they see fit, whether buying things, investing, or saving. Every year, the Tax Foundation calculates Tax Freedom Day the day when the United States as a whole has earned enough money to pay its tax bill. It's a handy way to understand how much of the nation's income goes to taxes. In 2015, Tax Freedom Day came on April 24th. For the first 113 days of the year, nearly a third of the calendar, America was working for the government, so to speak. Beginning April 24th, we got to work for ourselves and our families. Liberals who want to raise taxes should answer the question, exactly how much of the year should we have to work for the government? Don't higher taxes bring in more money for the government? Not necessarily. To understand the full story on high taxes, you have to know about something called the Laffer Curve. The concept is named after Arthur Laffer, a well-known American economist. The Laffer Curve illustrates an important point that modern-day economists have come to learn about taxes. As the graph below shows, when tax rates are low, raising them can bring in more revenue to the government. At some point, however, if the government raises taxes too much, those high taxes will start to be a drag on the economy for the reasons explained above. As the economy slows down, people and businesses make less money. That means there is less income and profit for the government to tax. As a result, tax revenues for the government begin to drop, even though the government is raising the tax rate. The more the government raises tax rates, the more the economy slows, and the less tax revenue the government receives. Economists disagree about the exact point at which high tax rates begin to send tax revenues down. Much depends on the kind of tax, the state of the economy, and other factors. The bottom line is that raising taxes too much can actually decrease tax money coming to the government. This happened, for example, during the Great Depression of the 1930s. The government raised taxes on imported goods with a law known as the Smoot-Hawley Tariff, but revenues from those taxes went down. For a good online explanation of the Laffer Curve and how it works, visit the Prager University website, www.prageruniversity.com, and watch the economics video called Lower Taxes, Higher Revenue. Why can't rich people pay all the taxes? First, let's see what would happen if we asked super-rich people to pay all the taxes. Multi-billionaires like Bill Gates, founder of Microsoft, Warren Buffett, the country's most famous investor, and Larry Page and Sergey Brin, founders of Google. In 2014, Bill Gates was worth around $80 billion. The federal government spent about $3.5 trillion that year. That means the government could seize all of Bill Gates' wealth and would get only one forty-fourth of the money needed to cover its expenses for that year. It would still need to find 43 other people about as rich as Bill Gates to take all of their wealth to pay for just one year of spending. The problem is that there are very few people anywhere near as rich as Bill Gates. You can see where this is going. The government would very quickly eat up all the fortunes it could find. There just aren't enough billionaires to cover the federal government spending year after year. And we haven't even taken into account the spending of state and local governments. What about the people who aren't super rich but still make a lot of money? What if the government demanded that they pay all the taxes? In fact, 
they already do pay a huge portion of the nation's annual tax bill. Just 5% of all taxpayers make over $200,000 a year, but that top 5% pays about 70% of all federal income taxes paid by the American people. The Bible tells us that of those to whom much is given, much is asked.